Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Andres Garcia. I'm the executive director of the Petit Institute. Uh, so it's a pleasure to welcome you to the first of the Petit Entrepreneurship Academy. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to Cindy because this was her idea. And I think it's a great thing uh, for us to have uh, at this level. And just to let you know that there's going to be more of these events. We're deciding the frequency, but the idea is to have a series of events to address important issues along the way. Um, as you can see, we're being recorded because we hope to we will keep this in a database for reference to you and others that couldn't come today. And I was, I'm happy to see trainees and happy to see faculty. Uh, you know, if you like it, invite your friends and colleagues to come to future ones. So thank you. Enjoy the pizza. Hello, everybody, and thank you for attending this inaugural event. And we're really excited uh, to launch this uh, Entrepreneurship Academy. Uh, this uh, educational series is going to be developed in conjunction with uh, Venture Lab, Georgia Tech's Venture Lab. And um, Venture Lab's uh, remit is really to um, assist. Uh, they have an educational component and also a company creation component. And so it really is um, to, to help uh, graduate students and faculty that have uh, Georgia Tech IP create companies. Uh, as um, <clears throat> Andres mentioned, uh, these will be recorded and uh, will be, uh, they'll be available on the Petit Institute website at some time in the near future. I also wanted to give a shout out to uh, another seminar series. It was uh, first, it was initially called the Health Innovation Commercialization Series. Now it's the Bench to Market Series. This is spo sponsored by uh, Coulter and the Georgia Clinical and Translational Science Alliance, or GT, uh, GTCTSA. And the next series is on September 27th. And it's going to focus on how to build a winning startup team. And actually, Kirk Barnes will be uh, speaking at that as well. And um, so our speakers today, I'd just like to introduce uh, Kirk Barnes and Jane McCracken. Um, Kirk uh, is, th this seminar, th this particular event is on uh, networking for entrepreneurs and also on uh, once you're doing the networking, how to talk about your technology to uh, non-technical folks. So the first half, the first 20 minutes, uh, Kirk will be leading and then we're going to turn it over to Jane. And we also have a visitor today, Bill Midget, who, uh, who Jane will, uh, will introduce. And Jane is going to be talking about how to give an effective elevator pitch. Uh, so um, let's talk about Kirk. Uh, many of you know Kirk. Uh, Kirk is the uh, co-founder and president of a, a new um, a venture called Transform Med. Uh, this is a business development firm focused on uh, bringing healthcare-related technologies to the market. Uh, Kirk has a background in uh, globally commercializing biopharma, medical device, digital health, and nanotech-based products, including several blockbuster billion-dollar products. Kirk's areas of responsibility have encompassed leadership, business development, global marketing, lobbying, and market access. Recently, and this is how we all probably know Kirk, he served as a startup catalyst at the uh, Advanced Technology Development Center, or ATDC, uh, which is an incubator that's housed as, uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, he uh, recently raised uh, the funds to launch uh, ATDC's first healthcare technology program. Kirk is also the author of his upcoming book titled Profits, Promotions, and Power Through People, which is a how-to guide for networking. Kirk is married to his college sweetheart and has two children. Now for Jane. Jane is the assistant director of ATDC. Uh, she has an extensive career as well as an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. She founded and served in the C-suite of five technology companies, including those in healthcare, software, and e-commerce. She has raised more than $100 million in funding for those companies and has achieved a successful, successful exit in each. Two of the companies commercialized university IP. Prior to her career as an entrepreneur, Jane raised funds for and managed two venture capital organizations in the UK, as well as established a 50-person business angel network. McCracken has served on boards for public and private companies, as well as government-related and nonprofit organizations. She obtained her bachelor's degree from Wake Forest University and a master's degree at the Georgia Institute of Technology. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Kirk, who's going to uh, be talking about the importance of networking. Thank you. 
All right, so I, I spared you guys. I don't have any slides, so there's no slide whipping today. Um, but I'd like to start off with a question and a little humility uh, to talk about networking. So the first thing that I'll, I'll ask you guys, you don't have to answer out loud, is how did someone like me end up being in a room with people like you, some of the brightest minds in the world, considering that I don't have a science background, I don't have a master's nor a PhD, I didn't grow up in Atlanta, I didn't go to Georgia Tech, but here I am being uh, humbly invited to speak to you about networking. And I think just that alone will help you understand the place that I'm coming from. So went to a small school in Florida called Florida A&M University. I have a bachelor's degree in business economics. I just happened to stumble upon the pharmaceutical industry out of college. And over a series of unfortunate events, I was forced to get really good at networking. So some of you are pretty early in your career. Some of you, I'll say, are more seasoned and have gone through different things in life. Um, but I could tell you that my experience in networking was forced to me because I've been through not one, not two, not three, but four corporate downsizings, company closings, layoffs, whatever you want to call it, and it forces you to develop some skills that you need to survive. And whether you guys believe it or not, networking is one of those things that usually isn't taught in colleges. I, last I checked, there's no degree, master's degree of networking. You know, your parents, or well, I'll say my parents, didn't teach me about networking. And so circumstances usually force you to learn it, or you figure out that, oh, wow, that meeting, I met somebody, and I wish I was more prepared for it. Um, and what I like to think is networking is, is the difference between two commensurate people, two equal people, two equal entities. One will get the look, and one doesn't. Right? You can look the same on paper, but the one that has people advocating for you is the one that usually gets ahead, and particularly in my space where I have uh, done hiring, I've actually um, done business with different people, I've actually uh, had contractors solicit me to do business, and usually the ones that I've, if I'm vacillating back and forth between two, and they both look comparable in their skill and ability, the one that I usually go with is the one I can call somebody and say, hey, do you know Andre? So do you know Jane? They're trying to sell me something. They want to work with me. And usually that person will validate you. And there's a saying I've, I've learned that um, in networking, the goal is to have as many people wearing your T-shirt as possible. Like there's a lot of decisions that are made when you have no idea that conversation's even taking place. And that's when you want to have people that can stand up and say, oh, I've done business with Bill. Uh, he's talented. He's smart. He's not crazy. He won't make you look bad. He won't do anything stupid. And I vouch for him, right? And that's a lot of what networking is. So networking at, at its core, um, I'll define it as really at its core, it's helping people. And there's a saying, if you haven't heard, if you help enough people get what they want, you will eventually get what you want, right? And so at its core, it's really just the ability to, to, to help people. Now, Networking, I almost hate that word, to be honest, because when you hear it, people usually roll their eyes um, and they think, oh, this is one of those things I'm going to learn about, going into some event that I don't want to go to, meeting people that I don't know, and then the first thing I want to do is find somebody I know so I don't feel uncomfortable. And I know for any introverts in the room, it's a major energy suck because being around all those people and having to constantly be on is draining. But networking can be very fulfilling if it's done intentionally and strategically. And the way that you approach science, the way that you approach any project, it's no different from how you approach networking. And it's just some, some key things that you need to have in mind. So um, in fact, the book that I wrote, and I'm writing, I'm almost done with, it's intentionally titled uh, Profits, Promotions, and Power Through People. And the profits part is really, profits is basically obtaining anything that you get a net gain from. Right. And so I think about profit not in the sense of just building a business, but in the sense of getting ahead in life. Um, promotions, whether you believe it or not, every time that you talk to somebody, every time that you go out and you represent yourself, you're promoting yourself. You're promoting, you have the ability to promote other people you know. You have the ability to advocate for other people. So you are, whether you realize it or not, you are always promoting something. And power, some people will hear power and think that it means that you dominate people, you have your thumb on folks, and you can make them do what you want. Power, in my mind, is just having the ability to facilitate change. And, and I could tell you from someone that, like myself that has gone through a lot of layoffs, one of the things I'm very passionate about is being able to help people that go through similar circumstances. And I think that's a 
power in a very positive way, right? Um, and the thing that I will ask you guys to think about is what have you been able to accomplish in your career without people? The best invention, no matter what it is, starts with people. The people that will actually, the way that you get money for that invention, the checks don't write themselves through people. You know, when you are actually needing to go meet somebody for the first time, it's easier if you have some people that will facilitate that introduction. So that's just enough about back, uh, background about networking. And so my perspective is I look at networking in three different buckets. So I look at internal net, uh, networking, external networking, and what I call crisis networking. So internal networking is how do you navigate getting to know the right people within your respective organization, right? So that's not going to be my focus today, but it's a different mindset when you're trying to navigate um, the right people within Georgia Tech, right? Or the right people in the, in the corporate world when I was at Pharma, how do I navigate and get things done within an organization? For example, I was a salesperson, marketing person, did contracting, um, and it wasn't until a mentor told me inside an organization there are three departments that are critical to the success of anybody. And I would say it somewhat holds true for even academic institutions. Um, and as my salesperson mind, I never guessed correctly what those departments were. So give an example. One is getting to know the people in HR. Who knows when the company is going to expand? Who knows when the company is going to contract? Who knows whose position is going to be redefined? HR runs all of that. Right, so they're critical to understanding if you want to be promoted, if you want to move up, if you want to understand the health of the organization, that's a department to get to know, right? Um, another one I learned is if you also get to know what's happening with the people, you want to know what's happening with the money. So you get to know the people in finance. So for me, for example, in my uh, role as a director, there was this thing called budget that we had to adhere to, but by getting to know the people in finance, I learned that there was some other discretionary budget that many people didn't know about. So getting and building a relationship with finance was something that I learned as well. So internal networking, different subject. External networking is what we're here talking about today. How do you get to know people? You have no idea who they are. They're outside of your immediate circle. And so that's what I'm going to spend today talking about. Crisis networking. Um, you either have been on one side of cri a crisis networking, and if you take a guess what it is, it's um, when you get your new appointment, Andres, I'll pick on you. Yeah, that's fine. Right? So uh, bring it on, right? So when Andres became, it, it got in his current position, there may have been people that haven't talked to Andres in 10, 15, 20 years, and they're out of a job or out of a position, or they need help with their research, and they see that Andres has this new position now. And out of the blue, he gets this email. Oh, I saw your new position on LinkedIn. I'm so happy for you. It'd be great if we connect. You know, I'd love to work, and work with you and find out what you're doing. That is crisis networking. That is like people you've never heard from, and like, and not never, never, haven't heard from in years, but when your position changes or their position, they get caught off guard, then they are in a frenzy trying to find someone to help them out, but they haven't made any deposits along the way. And so, you know, for me being on the, the end where I've gotten those calls, what do you think my likelihood of really, really wanting to inconvenience myself, take time, and help somebody out that I haven't talked to in years versus people that are constantly touching base with me? Probably not, not too high. Right, so I help avoid people from falling into the crisis networking space, right? So now getting actually into uh, networking, there are four key steps, four key components that are critical, particularly if you are in a space, you have a new idea and you're trying to articulate it and get people to hear what it is you're working on. Four key things. And more times than not, most people, as you know, I don't filter too much, most people suck at all of them, right? I just tell it like it is, right? But the ability is once you know, you can then start to hone this craft. Um, I think that networking is directly responsible for where I am, both personally and professionally. It has helped me um, get, it's actually helped me travel the world for free. Um, every job that I've ever had, including my first job out of college, came from networking. In fact, in my role in hiring people, um, seven out of ten people that get hired get hired through networking and not through actually applying for a job. And I could tell you in being an HR steering committees before, majority of the time before a job is posted, 
the hiring people already know who they want to hire. It's a formality. So if you're looking for a job, you can apply online all day long, but usually the decision is already made before that job hits the internet or hits monster.com or whatever the case may be, right? So the job, the purpose is to get to know the people that, are, that know when the hiring is gonna happen before the job happens, right? So four key components of networking. The first one is purpose. What is your goal? What is the purpose that you want to accomplish when you're going to a networking event? Um, and I think this is so important because as we all have jobs and different things that we have to do, there's going to be a point where you absolutely hate and detest certain parts of your job. It might be your coworker. I might say, I can't stand Andres. He gets on my nerves. I'm not saying that, you know, because I do like you. Um, but there are parts of your job that you absolutely hate, and it's the purpose that gets you through that. Right, so part of networking is understanding what is your goal, and it could be very specific to an event. For example, if I'm going to a networking event, in my mind, um, it's worth my time to go because I want to get something out of it. And in my head, or even written down, I will say, success to me looks like this when I come out of this event. Right, meaning that when I go here, I want to meet Jane McCracken because Jane has experience that I want to tap into, and if I can just get five minutes with her, I can make the most of it, and then my goal is to get a follow-up meeting. Usually when you're networking, your first contact, your first goal is to make an impression so that you get subsequent meetings to go more in depth to talk about what it is you really want to talk about. Um, and, and I think when I look back, I'll give you an example from a corporate perspective. One of the wasted, most wasted um, opportunities that I saw is when I was um, at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, for example, every year we have this thing called a, uh, a national meeting. So once a year, the CEO, the president, CFO, head of research, all of sales, the entire organization comes to one place. And so people that want to move up don't take advantage of the fact that I can go find this person, I know where they're gonna be, you see the agenda, but you don't think ahead of time that I can actually go meet Andres, or I can go meet Bill, and I can get time with them that Otherwise, I'd have to go through their admin, I have to get on their calendar. I have them captive for a week, but I fail to take advantage of that opportunity. So I think just having a purpose when you go to an event, being very strategic, thinking about what it is that I really want to get out of it. And then that will also help you discern, is this event worth my time? There are events every week. You get invited to a ton of different events. So how do you discern which one is really worth your time? Well, doing a little research and finding out if I go to this event, I'm gonna meet the right people because I have specifically in mind what it is I wanna accomplish. So purpose in the why behind why you wanna go networking could be a job, could be raising money, could be finding a partner, could be finding a researcher. Um, for example, if you're going to a conference, um, which leads to my, my second uh, component, which is preparation. So purpose, <coughs> preparation. So for example, when I go to a conference, I probably spend two to three hours minimum in, in preparing to go to that conference. And preparation is a very wide category, and I'll just give you some things to think about. For example, if you're going to a conference, do you know where the conference is being held? If you're going there from work, do you have to park? So that you're not, you know, getting the game plan on logistics so that you're not rushed, like I was getting down here today because my app didn't work on the bird scooter, so I had to walk, so I'm finally now cooling off. Right, so just preparing and understanding where, where you're gonna go. What type of setup is this gonna be? Is this gonna be a seated uh, auditorium or is this gonna be round table, high tops? Because if it's seated, you wanna get there early so that you can see where people are sitting and strategically figure out how to get close to the people that you wanna talk to. If it's a high top, getting there early doesn't necessarily mean so much because you can navigate the room, right? So that's just one idea of preparation. Secondly, um, there's this little thing called Google or LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, but if you have an idea, for example, when I look at a conference I'm going to attend, I look at who's attending and there are certain people that I, um, I definitely want to meet. And so I spend time looking at what, um, you know, what their, their history is on um, LinkedIn. I look at do we have any common connections. Um, I look and find out how much, as much information as I can. It could be the type of research that they've done, could be a recent paper that they've written, because that is ammunition to help me when I get in front of somebody to get me to help them talk about one of their favorite subjects. So what do you think are people's favorite subject to talk about? 
themselves, right? And it's very easy to, to facilitate somebody, a, a discussion with somebody you don't know. When you say, uh, I get to pick on Andres because he's right here. Andres, it's so nice meeting you. Um, you know, I recently read the paper you wrote. You know, tell me a little bit more about that research. And the faucet gets turned on, right? So that's something else that people underestimate, particularly like as uh, Jane and Bill are going to talk about investing. You know you're going to go meet with XYZ venture capital firm. Did you research the types of investments that they've done in the past year? Did you research what they currently have an appetite for? Did you research the person that you're meeting with? Do you have any people in common? Do you, so that can help you formulate how to best position what it is you're trying to sell them. Because then you can say, hey, I saw you've already invested in a nanofabrication platform. Walk me through what that looked like and how you made that decision. So not only do you get them to talk about something they've done, but they're also giving you their game plan. They're telling you how I made this decision, which then gets, gets to help you formulate how you articulate what it is you're going to say. Um, other things, preparation. So think about it. If you work for a company or you work at a university, but you also have your own idea you're trying to promote, when you go to meet people, what business card are you going to give them? So do you go to give them your corporate business card and then say, well, this is just my corporate business card. I'm doing my own thing, but you know, I'm going to turn it off in the back of and I'm going to write my personal email and scribble my phone number down and hopefully you know, you'll connect with me and don't get confused. Or are you wise enough to spend $10 and go to Vistaprint or Staples and order your own personal business card that has your name, your area of expertise, and how to contact you? So again, thinking about how you are promoting yourself and how you want to convey yourself when you're meeting people. So all these things fall into the area of preparation that many people take for granted. Um, and it is funny because when I, when I think back about different chance opportunities you have, or I've had, the, the number of times I think about, oh, I wish I had this ready, or I wish I had my website ready, or I wish I had my LinkedIn profile updated. So it's being very intentional and strategic about making sure you position yourself well before you go to any networking event, okay? So preparation, big category, those are a couple things that I just touched on. So purpose, preparation, presentation. What do you do when you're actually in front of people? Right. So going back to the preparation, if this is a Silicon Valley type event, and I'm out there, no, Jane, she'll probably, you know, will resonate when I say this. If I go to a Silicon Valley event dressed like a New Yorker with a suit and tie and a navy blue, people are not going to relate to me. I'm going to, they're going to say like, okay, he, he doesn't get it, he or she doesn't get it, you know, um, and it's a mark against you mentally. So understanding how to be comfortable when you're presenting people and mirroring the environment that you're in is very important. Um, thinking about how do you engage people in this scenario. So you go to a networking event, round table, and uh, Michelle is right there. I want to talk to Michelle, but there's four people around her. Right? But that's the person I need to talk to. And it's in the middle of the evening, so I don't know how long she's going to be here. So I'm standing over here. So do I just wait? And hopefully all these people will have something to do or have to go to the bathroom at the same time. <laughs> right? And then I'll be, it'll be fortuitous enough for me to go get her. Or how do I learn to walk over and position myself so that I can be engaging in the discussion and understand that there's a, a, so, a certain amount of social aptitude to understand how to insert myself into that conversation without being socially awkward. Sometimes it's making eye contact with somebody that's right next to her or just step, stepping in. And most people that aren't socially awkward will get it and they'll step aside and let you in. But just sometimes they won't. You have to give them a little bow and they'll, they'll figure it out. But that is a real life situation to think through how do I navigate? Because the likelihood of somebody that you want to talk to at an event, the chances are that there's a lot of other people that want to talk to them. There's the chances are there's a friend of theirs that they're just comfortable, they're going to be hanging out with all night. So you have to be prepared to say what you want to say in front of other people and be, be confident enough to be able to articulate what it is that you want to say and convey. Now, I don't, I don't advocate you guys trying to be like me, because that could be disastrous. Uh, be yourself, but just be thoughtful of how you can leverage what you have so that you can clearly articulate to the right people that you need to meet. And a lot of that is based upon your preparation and understanding who you're meeting with and being armed with certain tools that you can pull out your belt. So sometimes it looks like this. Michelle is standing there and there's people around her and you step into the conversation and you hear somebody mention the word research. Well, 
you did your preparation, and then you can step and say, you know, that's a great piece of research that you did. And in fact, I also read about this other piece of research. You know, tell me about that. That's a quick way to engage, right? Or if they say, oh, you know, I'm doing this research project with Novartis Pharmaceuticals. That's interesting. I have a good friend that works at Novartis that you know as well. Don't you know Bill Majette? That's another way you insert yourself into the conversation. So just finding these common bridges and understanding how to uh, engage yourself in the discussion. Um, at heart, if you couldn't tell, I'm a extrovert, actually an uh, ambivert, so I'm a little bit of both. But as a salesperson, I can talk a lot. I can talk all, I can be here all day with you guys talking about this, but I have 20 minutes, so I'm gonna keep it there. Um, but in sales, there's an acronym called ABC. Does anybody know what ABC is? Always be closing. Salespeople, always be closing. Basically is, when I'm sitting across from somebody, I don't have a sale until I get them to commit. In my mind, in networking, closing doesn't mean get them to buy something from you. Closing means it's, a, it's an agreement on what is our next course of action. What are we gonna agree? What can I get you to agree to right now? The chances that I can tell you everything about my technology in the two minute stand up is, is nil. You know, and sometimes what happens is that works against you. When you say, hey, uh, so nice to meet you. My name's Kirk Barnes. I have this technology. It's nanofabrication. We're able to print these small um, uh, 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 barcodes on every type of substrate. You know, we've done work here. We've done there. We've done this, blah, 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 blah. And in the back of the person's mind, they're really thinking, like, I can't wait to get out of here because this person just is spitting up on me, and they haven't engaged me at all whatsoever, right? So. Thinking about that and, and how you go about engaging people and how you go about um, finding a way to connect with them is, is so critical. Um, and closing looks something like this, right? So if we're having a discussion, and sometimes what happens, as I just talked about, I inserted myself into a discussion, and I see they have to leave or I have to leave. So I might say something like, hey, Michelle, I know there's other people you want to talk to. Um, here's my card, right? Um, do you have a card? And if not, you know, what would be the best way to contact with you? I'd love to follow up in the next two weeks to talk about what I'm working on. I think it falls in line nicely with something that you're doing. More times than not, she'll say yes. If you ask that, when they get that email from you, or when they get that phone call, before they decline it, <laughs> or before they delete it, there's a little playback that says, I did remember speaking with this person. Um, let me go ahead and at least give them some time, right? Um, and the, the other thing I'll say is, is goes into the fourth thing. So purpose, preparation, presentation, the, the last part I call the follows, right? First thing is, um, first part of the follows is follow up. So is anybody familiar with the show, The First 48? It's on TV, it's The First 48 show. And it basically talks about when crimes happen, you have 48 hours, the first 48 hours are critical to solving the case. The first 48 hours after you meet someone for the, for the first time, that is the window of engagement. Because after that, it drops off precipitously. So that engagement might be you connect with them on LinkedIn. That engagement might be you send them an email and you reference something that you discussed. And it doesn't have to be a long dissertation. In fact, the shorter the better. Um, hey, Bill, it was great meeting you at this event, right? So you're making the connection. We met at the Georgia Tech event last Tuesday. Today is Thursday. I just wanted to follow up with you per our discussion and try to find some time as we agreed upon. I'll be in your area the next, next Tuesday or Wednesday. Which one of those days would be best for us to connect? Right? Usually if you give some suggestions, people will pick either or, or they'll say, well, Tuesday and Wednesday don't work for me, but Friday is better. Right? You don't make them think too much. But if you say, hey, when is a great time for you to get together? Never, I'm busy, I got stuff to do. I don't have any good, I don't have any free time, right? So you suggest to people in your follow, and that's just a very simple tactic that works, more times than not. But the follow-up part is critical. So how many times, you don't have to raise your hand, to think about it, you go out to an event, you actually do exchange business cards with somebody, you get the business card, and then three months later, you pull it out of your pocket, or your purse, or your briefcase, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, there's this, I forgot all about them, wow. I wish, you know, and then it's like, so much has happened in three months, it's like, well, it's, you know, probably not important, I'll just wait till I see them again. That is a major opportunity lost, 
And who knows what happens in three months? That person could have connected with somebody. It could have opened a window of opportunity for you. You just never know what happens. But that first 48 hours after you meet somebody is critical to, to follow that continuum of engagement, right? Um, the other thing I'll, I'll go back to is sometimes, uh, and I can't speak for you, my memory is horrible. So I have to be very intentional and disciplined about when I meet someone, when I leave that engagement, I go write notes on what we discussed. Met them at, um, might be on their business card, I'll write on the back of it. Met them at the Georgia Tech event. Um, married, has three kids. Um, just got back from Geneva, Switzerland. I'm um, getting ready to publish a paper in Nature. And um, they agreed to give me you know, 20 minutes um, within the next two weeks. Right? And so I actually have a way of capturing that. When I create a contact or a profile, I put that in the notes section. So I know when I send that person the email, the one thing that I look at is, okay, well, what is my previous engagement like with this person? And it makes it more personal instead of just saying, um, when I talk with them, hey, uh, I just want to talk to you about you know, my idea and follow up on what we discussed on. But I can do a little bit of small talk to ease into it. Say, hey, you know, tell me again, how was your trip to Geneva? What was the best part of that trip? And they're like, wow this person actually listened to what I was saying. They, they actually make me feel important. And, and ultimately, there's a, a little three phrase word that comes, uh, that I reference when it comes to doing business with people. And it's know, like, trust. And it's usually part of the buying process. Once I get to know you, then I eventually, hopefully, will like you. And then after I know you, like you consistently over a period of time, I begin to trust you. So you think about buying decisions, you think about the people you spend money with, you think about why realtors, you know, they stake their livelihood on building relationships because they want people to know them, like them. I mean, do you really want to do business with somebody you don't like? Would you really feel good about giving somebody your hard-earned money when you don't know them or don't like them, right? So follow up, follow through, and it's very simple. When you say you're going to do something, you actually do it. So if you say to sell, tell somebody that, hey, I'm going to introduce you to Jane, she's a great person, um, and the person is expecting it from you, but you never do it, they may never say anything to you, but they remember. They do remember. So follow up, follow through, follow on. So once you've had that first meeting, find ways to continually engage with them. So sometimes it's little things like if you're on LinkedIn together, you see they got promoted, or you see they wrote an article, to comment on it. Right. Send a follow-up email just saying, a phrase I have is, hey, I'm just touching base with you. I hope everything is going well. If there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. That little phrase has continually paid a lot of dividends. Right. So four steps to recap. Preparation, uh, preparation, purpose, preparation, presentation, and follow-up. So um, that's my time. I thank you guys for hearing me out. Um, Cindy has my contact information, and I will tell you guys if there's anything that I can do to ever help you out. Cindy has my information, and I'd love to follow up with you and meet you guys individually. So thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. And now my good friend and former boss, <laughs> Jane McCracken. I am going to talk to you about doing an elevator pitch. And it segues very nicely with what Kirk was talking about. So I am going to prepare you guys to get ready to show up at an event with a form of words that will help you nudge right into that social situation. And we're going to get set up on my PC real quick. Okay, so I'm just going to wing it, all right? You're doing an elevator pitch. What is an elevator pitch? You all have heard about it, right? It is 30 seconds telling what you're all about, what you're doing to make an impression on somebody. So you're going from the ground floor all the way to the roof, and you've only got that time to talk about it. All you want to do with an elevator pitch is get to the next step. 
which as Kirk was alluding to, get to a next meeting. So let's keep an elevator pitch in perspective. How many of you tweet? Very few, okay, it's all right, right? But if you think about a tweet, a tweet is how many characters? 140, right, okay. That's circa, what is that, about 20, 30 words? What you wanna do in your elevator pitch is maybe three or four tweets. So we're not asking for a whole lot, right? People remember, people speak between 120 and 200 words per minute, okay? But people comprehend somewhere around 75 or 80. So we're going for about three, the equivalent of three tweets. It's not a whole lot. What, do you, what are the components in an elevator pitch? It's very simple. You have the problem, you talk about your solution, the benefit that you're going to bring, and you give a reason why it is important. And then to follow on what Kirk was saying, you then kind of say something that will follow up, like, can I tell you more about it? Can we meet over coffee? Can I tell you more about it? Okay. So this will give you just a few more visual things going on here. <coughs> if I can type. Yes, we know that's not my password. Okay, let's see. Oh, so the PowerPoint's not even up. Never mind. No, 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 don't worry about it. Um, so you've got those points. The problem, your solution, the benefit you're bringing, why you're doing it, and then you want to wrap up with the ask. So in my PowerPoint, I had a couple of statistics. One of the things you need to appreciate when you prepare your elevator pitch is that less than 0.1% of the population is a scientist or a research engineer. So think about who you're talking to because most of the time you're not talking to another scientist or another research engineer. So your elevator pitch has to be incredibly simple. You have to get the jargon out of it, and you have to make it so that everyone can understand what you're saying. Think about it in terms of a tweet, keeping it pretty simple. So I had some examples for you of a couple of ATDC companies and a company I worked with. So one of our ATDC companies is in the IoT space and they start their elevator pitch, and I'm trying to remember it now with all the, the, the bit of detail they put in, that there is a percent of the population that doesn't appreciate when they're wheezing, they're coughing, or they're doing shallow breathing. And this leads to a huge number of health problems and a major impact on our health system. My company has developed an easy to use device that can monitor lung function in real time, upload that information to our platform, and help point out when there's problems. This is going to be a major benefit because it is in real time. It's gonna offer important information. It's really easy to use because it's a wearable. Can I come talk to you a little bit more about it? That's an elevator pitch. Very simple, very concise. That company is called Stratus Labs. So if you know Richard Powers, he's the co-founder of that company. Ah, you do know Richard, yeah. That's what his company is doing. How many people know the company Moonlight Therapeutics? Okay, well, you guys would. 
So Samir's pitch is that, I can't remember the statistic, but a number of people suffer from peanut allergies. And do you know the only thing they can do is avoid being around peanuts and carrying an EpiPen. Moonlight Therapeutics has developed a technology that's a patch. It simply sits on the top of your skin and it is going to deliver an immunotherapy that will help with peanut allergies. It's very simple, it's wearable, you don't have to carry an EpiPen and it's going to save lives. Can I come and talk to you about this some more? Very simple elevator pitch. The science will come later. You just want to very simply talk about what you do and hook that person in what you're doing. Think about going out and fishing. You're preparing your elevator pitch ahead of time, so that means you're baiting the hook. You throw it out into the water and you let it sit there for a while. And this is as you're networking. And you come and start delivering your elevator pitch, I guarantee some people are going to bite. And the way you reel them in is you get another meeting set up. It's really that kind of a simple process. One more elevator pitch. One in nine men will suffer from prostate cancer in their life. It is the second leading cause of death for cancer after skin cancer for men. Let me change that. It's the second leading cause of cancer in men, skin cancer being number one. It is also the second leading cause of death in men after lung cancer. My technology is a hormone therapy that men can take. We're gonna formulate it into an oral drug Men will take it once a day. This will keep their cancer from growing, which means that they will have a longer life and a better quality of life. Can I come tell you about that? And people will want to tell. That company was bought by Johnson & Johnson for a billion dollars. So it can happen. But did I talk about how we formulated the hormone therapy in the lab? Did I give you the chemical name of it? No. It's very simply, I'm trying to bait the hook, reel you in, and get another meeting. So when you're gonna prepare an elevator pitch, remember a couple of things. Think of who your audience is. Most people are not going to have the deep scientific knowledge that you have. So tone down the description of what you're doing to something that's very simple, which is point number two. Keep it very simple. The third thing is to follow the formula. State what the problem is. State why it's a problem. Talk about your solution. Explain the value of your solution or the benefit and pause on an ask, finalize it with an ask. Can I come talk to you a little bit more about it? Finally, practice. If you don't think that Kirk has had a lot of practice with elevator pitches, you're crazy. Or if you don't think that I've had a lot of practice with elevator pitches, you wanna be put in a situation that you can talk about what you're doing no matter who it is that gets in the elevator with you. Because you never know at the conference if the person in the elevator with you is who you need to be talking about. And if you practice and just have something as simple as three tweets long in your head to talk about what you're doing, you are gonna land follow-on meetings you are going to find an opening statement to nudge your way in during a networking event. It is that simple. Now, you all are gonna have lots of opportunities to meet people, and I'd like to introduce you to someone who volunteers his time, not only in IBB, 
but over at the ATDC at the Georgia Research Alliance and beyond. And his name is Bill Majette, or I should, sorry, I said that improperly. Sorry. Bill Midget. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bill is a serial entrepreneur in the healthcare space. He is also now an angel investor and a wonderful mentor to companies who are growing and uh, scaling and trying to secure funds. And he's going to tell you a little bit about what he looks for when he's talking to people. Think about what he's saying because you may want to slip a few of those things into your elevator pitch. So Bill, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Hi, everybody. I do say midget because people remember it. The correct pronunciation is midget, but anyway, you may forget both. I uh, uh, am glad to be here. I'm always delighted to work with Kirk and Jane. I'm a corporate guy until three years ago when we sold our company in a large leveraged buyout and then they threw me out. That's what happens, but uh, they had smarter people. But, um, but uh, I am a mentor. I work with a couple of venture capital funds. I'm an investor now and I, my experience is in the healthcare and bioscience space. <clears throat> Most recently, I was the CEO of Porex Corporation, which anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, it's a top secret company, so it's hard to hear of it, but it was like an incubator of itself. We developed porous polymer materials, and here's the key. It's a simple, it's plastic, right? Well, that plastic, taken from an idea to a finished product, is on, it regulates light on a space station. It's now the material used in reconstructive implants for the head and face. When you hear about implantable pancreas or drug dosing devices, Porex is in all of those around the world. Now, why is that important? Because we converted ideas, compelling ideas, into finished products. You have compelling ideas. And a famous Thomas Edison quote, we've all heard of him, it is that the value of any idea is only in its ability to be sold because in its sale is utility and in utility is success. So. The next Thomas Edison's in the room, but you have to think whatever your idea is through to its deployment, its use, because everybody likes talking about great ideas, but you have to convert that. And I think that you've heard about how to connect with people, but you have to connect with yourself first, and that's what I want to talk to you about. If you get in front of investors, um, they're gonna, I, I actually have a prop. It's a piece of paper. We'll pass these around. Well, if you'll have to share, you can take a photo, you can keep them. This is part of a presentation that I've done in the past and it's to, oops, sorry, to simplify um, what should be included in any discussion you have. The, the questions you need to have answered in your own head, pass it around, they're free. There's only 10 of them, so I'll do it that way. Here you go. Um, this is what you have to be able to answer in your own mind, and please do share them, pass them around. In its simplest form, there are very complex models and questionnaires and diligence that investors do that would grill you over a lot of details before you'll ever see a nickel. And you need to see those nickels if you're going to get your product to move, and you could invest you could get your parents to loan you some money. You could get your, your brother, your sister. You could spend your life savings, but eventually you're going to need an outside investor. So what is an investor looking for? An investor, I'm going to have to share one of these. Here we go. Um, first of all, these, they're looking for a new standard of performance. They're looking for something that's a difference maker, not a better than or just as good as or cheaper. A lot of people seem to think that Great inventions are things that do something cheaper. It's not. It's something that does something new, better, more cost effectively, but most importantly, it has the potential to be a new standard of performance. An Apple, an Uber, an Airbnb. That's what people invest in. Secondly, let me get my glasses on. Thanks. That's what happens when you get old. Um, a founder who knows not thinks. This is really important. If you are having a conversation with an investor and you say, I think this will work. I think that'll happen. We're feeling pretty good about it. You're done. You have to know. 
because the investor is only going to get behind somebody who really knows why they're doing something, why it will work. You can't know it will work, why it should work, what the value of it will be. If this happens, it'll cure diabetes. You have to think in large terms, because that's what's going to inspire people. So you have to know, don't think. Don't speak in terms of thinking things. Speak in terms of knowing. An extremely well-defined market. If you have an idea and you want to know where it's going to be used, really understand that. Talk to somebody. Jane just gave an example. Prostate cancer. That's pretty specific. But that's what it has to be because people relate to that. Not just I have a product that cures ailments that affect men. That's not going to do anything. Or cancer. That's too big. Prostate cancer, the second leading cause of death for, of cancers. Um, and why customers must buy. This is important. Think your product through to an end user who's going to buy it doesn't matter how they buy it. it if, if they're the end user of the product, we're all the end user of medical products, even though we don't buy them, an insurance company pays for it. You've got different decision makers there, but when you take a product to market, especially in the biomedical field, it's very complex. I come from it. One person pays for it, another person provides it, another person is the patient, and and so it's, it's a difficult field. It's, it's very difficult to navigate, but very rewarding if you get there. But you have to know why somebody must buy it. Don't talk about things that people should like, would like, might like. Why must they buy it if it's available? Well, it's because their chance of living is greater with a hormone therapy for prostate cancer than surgery. And you have to be able to prove it. Why must they buy it? Also. Um, and again, I'm going to point this out. This is for a conversation you have in an elevator pitch. It's also on a deck that you would build, and it would be consistent throughout. But these are the things, and Kirk said it, go, preparation is everything. Go through it in your head. Know your story. Know it cold and repeat yourself and make sure that every time you talk to somebody, they're hearing a consistent story. Um, Defendable technology, do you have a patent? Does anybody here have a patent yet? Good, some patents out there. Something about patents. The vast majority of patents are never defended even when they're violated. Why? Because you don't, who's got the money to defend a patent? Bunch of hands went up with patents, nobody has the money. And that's a reality, so a defendable technology a patent helps, but you have to have a strategy around who's gonna help you uh, defend that, or more importantly, is everything you know in the patent, or is some of it in your mind, in your tribal knowledge, your trade secrets, some things you don't want to make public. If you write a patent and it's filed, and if it's issued, that's public information. You've just told the world how your idea works. Decide what you want to disclose at that level, and how much you want to keep as your own personal trade secret. That you can defend unless you make a big mistake and, and reveal it. Um, a methodical, deliberate path to market. If you have an idea, know how it's going to be used. Know who would use it, how it would get there, be able to articulate that. Don't invent the greatest product of any type. Can't think of an example right now, but whatever it may be, if you don't have an idea of how that would connect up with that end user who must buy it. and. Um, Oh, well understood enemies and allies. This is something, and I don't want to make anybody cynical. You don't want to be as cynical as I am, but I can tell you that uh, when you develop your idea, even before it gets out of this institution, people, you know what people steal ideas, right? The vast majority of time it's accidental. That's the first thing to remember. People talk about all sorts of great ideas. How many, how many people have just come up with a great idea and said, I, I can't remember where I heard it. Everybody. And so what happens is, when you're developing something and it's really central to what your invention is, don't be careful how you talk about it. That's very important. People accidentally hear and then disclose by talking to someone else, and you can lose control pretty quickly. So it takes a discipline, and it's, it's up to you. Enemies and allies, when you look at investors, when you look at partnerships, you may get out there and there could be a 
you develop an idea and somebody wants to invest and they want to help take it to market. Well, again, to the Thomas Edison example uh, and General Electric, how many light bulbs have been invented that don't burn out over the decades? Dozens and dozens, I don't know how many exactly, but the point is GE did not want a light bulb that did not burn out on the market. So people who collaborated with GE thinking, there's a company that can help me be famous in light bulbs, boy, were they wrong. They had their idea purchased only to be put in a vault. So know who really can help you and think that through too, um, who your real partners are. And that, that's a little more complex. And I would say with that, that's when you talk to people like Jane or you talk to Kirk, you talk to people at the ATDC because you're going to meet a lot of people there who have been there, done that. They've taken products to market. They've suffered the pain and, you know, had the great victories. So it's really important to know um, who your real friends and, and uh, enemies are. Enemies, that's pretty harsh, but believe me, if you come out on the short end of something with your idea stolen or a failure to get it to market and it's because of execution on, with somebody you trusted, you'll find out quickly that that can happen. Logical financial model, it's very early when you have, oops, when you have a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, new idea and you say, what's the financial model? My sales, my expenses, my profits. You're not gonna have that, don't worry about it. But a logical financial model means <clears throat> when you develop an idea or when it is developed into a commercialized product, what's the size of the market? How big is it? What are you going after? Always know what you're going after because that will inspire an investor as well. If you say that people buy a whole lot of cars, that's not enough. If you say people buy electric cars that are four-seaters and, they, and the, this percentage of the market only needs to go 100 miles at a time before a recharge, that's a very specific understanding of a market and you may have a car that costs half as much, but appeals to 60% of the electric car drivers. I mean, it's really simple, but know that. Again, going back to the meetings you'll have, don't go into the meetings without having thought these things through because otherwise your idea will fall flat because you can't inspire somebody with what you're able to do with it. Um, management team alignment, you might be working on your own, you might have a partner, you might have different people you're collaborating with. An investor always is looking into the individual, and that's the last point too, a founder who will die on the hill. If you've got an idea, the passion you have for that idea will be contagious. If this is a hobby for you and you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I've got a job over down the street at, uh, at IBM, and this is what I'm doing on the weekend, you'll never get any interest. If, you, if this is something you really want to do and it's a personal mission, you'll never get any interest. If you've got an idea that could become the new standard of performance, something that could change a market or somebody's life or the way people live and you, you firmly believe it and you've got some people around you who are equally aligned, pardon me, and committed to that idea, like you're gonna see it through then you inspire people. Because an investor, it's a financial discussion. Investors are nice people, but the more they lose, the less they're able to invest in good ideas. So money is a great thing, but it has to be made in order to invest in the next great thing. So always remember that's where the investor is coming from. Sorry, do you have a question? faculty member quits their job to go start a company. That hardly ever happens. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could help me make that connection of how do you, so as the technology is at least in this context occurring in labs, where, where do you find that founder who's willing to die on the hill? Because it's sort of like you have to have this perfect alignment of the student who happens to be working on it wants to be that person, but that's not most students. How do we address that? Because I know very few faculty members that will say yes. I'm going to leave my position here and go do this. No, it's, it's, it's always a side project. My tenure position. My tenure position, yeah. right? Any, any thoughts on that? Sure, because I know some, uh, some uh, faculty at this school and at others uh, here at Emory and at UGA who 
left their tenured positions because they believed enough. And as you can imagine, that's pretty inspiring. If you're an investor and somebody says, I'm going to go swim across the English Channel and I'm, not doing, I'm doing it without a life jacket, that's pretty inspiring. Who here can swim a mile? One, two, three people can swim a mile. Who, if you fell out of a moving boat a mile from shore, could swim a mile? Wow, that's, that's a bigger number. But that makes sense. That means who can swim a mile? A bunch of people can. That's what people are looking for. Now, will they leave a tenured position? If they believe enough, they will. And it, and it happens. And then in other cases where they're not willing to do it, they're not willing to take that chance, they may have a business partner. They may take that idea and then get organized with somebody who's a, in, a professional in business, and they may become the chief technology officer of the company that's created, or the chief medical officer, or something like that, and then have others who are willing to die on the hill with them. And a lot of the dying on the hill is reputational as well. Nobody wants to die <laughs> within your field of study or field of expertise. So it happens, but it's a personal choice. As an investor, if there are three faculty members standing there all with the business, the one that's not willing to leave is not gonna get an investment unless they've organized some other way. The one who is willing to leave, that would have my attention. Because if they believe that much, if they know, not think, then I'm gonna be there with them. It's a tough one. I'm, fortunately, I never had to make that decision. Um, anyway, that's it. I've probably gone over. How are we doing for time? That was great. Um, yeah, we've gone a little over, so. Uh, please, please feel free to ask any of our presenters. Follow up on that because I, I, that, that makes complete sense to me. And I wonder at what level is that an obstacle for universities to actually translate technology? Because those fact, they're a minority. They're, if that's what we need, your university is not going to launch technology. So what are we doing? to facilitate the matching of the business person or the entrepreneur with the faculty member who will put themselves on the hill. Because if we're requiring the faculty member to do it, just it will happen, but it's gonna be, a lot of ideas are gonna die at the university because if that's what you're requiring. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, I think that there's um, lots of opportunities for very entrepreneurial graduate students to take the lead, entrepreneurial postdocs to take the lead. Um, it would really be great if there were more fellowships for postdocs that were interested in entrepreneurship. So that's something that would be really 